Yes. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our meeting, our Northboro School Com Committee open meeting on Wednesday, February 2nd, 2022. The time is 6.31 p.m. Um, and we are holding our meeting virtually tonight. Um, so before we begin, let me read the governor's order. Um, pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, an act relative to extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency signed into law on June 16th, 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance by members of the public will be permitted. Um, so tonight we're gonna start off with our agenda with audience sharing. And just as a review, um, in December, uh, all three committees adopted the public comment at school committee meetings policy B330. Um, and so anyone wishing to uh, make a comment, I do um, encourage you to take a look at that policy. Um, but essentially, uh, we do encourage respectful conversation um, from uh, members of the public, and we'd like to hear from you. Um, so if anyone would like to audience share tonight, we ask that you raise your virtual hand, and then we will allow you to speak. And I do see one person with their hand up. Um, and it looks like it's Rebecca Miahopoulos. Uh, sorry, Mahopoulos. Rebecca, Hi, whenever you're ready. Okay. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Thank you. And I know I'm on the agenda next, but I just um, did have one quick audience sharing piece. And that is um, I'm part of the Northboro Community Affairs Committee. And we are very excited to announce our first Kindness Week here in Northboro, which is starting Monday, February 7th, and it will go to February 13th. Um, the aim of this is to create a community in which we're all treated with kindness and respect. Um, the idea is just to encourage um, groups, clubs, nonprofits here in town to create some kind of um, activity or event uh, during throughout the week. So we've invited um, the school district, other school groups, um, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, contacted the library, senior center, um, to all get involved, I mean, the list goes on, but uh, churches to encourage them to um, do something as part of this week and something that really makes sense for their group. We've also provided everyone with a list of suggested activities, but are happy if people come up with their own too. And um, we've had a great response to this. We just kind of, I think we just announced it two weeks ago and also already many groups have come up with ideas and come to us with their ideas and where our role is really to just publicize them on our social media, on our website, to let people know what's going on during Kindness Week. The week will end also with um, a town-wide event at the Town Common um, from 4.30 to 5.30. We'll be giving out uh, luminary bags to everyone who attends. They will be asked to decorate them or write a word of kindness on them. And we'll be putting um, tea lights in the bag and then creating a big heart shape in the middle of town um, in the middle of the common. So it's just really kind of a visual and we'll also be giving out treats for the kids and um, little tickets that have an act of kindness you can do over the weekend. But it's our first and we've are already, yeah, it's already um, been received while I know Melican is going to be doing a sock drive for the homeless. I, um, I've heard that Proctor is going to be doing um, cards for um, the Coleman House and, they, and more. Um, Z is going to be doing a um, animal shelter collection drive. The Garden Club's going to be doing um, a food drive for the Northboro Food Pantry. Um, and the list goes on. Um, but check out our website, um, Northboro Community Affairs, and our Facebook page to see more about it. I don't want to take up too much time, but we're just really excited to get this off the ground. 
Thank you so much, Rebecca. And Rebecca, do you mind sharing your address for the record? Oh, oh, my address. Yeah, I forgot about that. Uh, Six <laughs> Mohican Avenue here in Northboro. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing, Rebecca. And we will be hearing from you shortly. I'm going to um, disable talking and then promote you as a panelist for the next part of the agenda. Okay. I think we also have Becky Johnson uh, in the audience that will be uh, presenting with um, Betsy Johnson, sorry, with uh, Rebecca. All right, thank you. Excellent, thank you. Um, and it looks like there are no other hands up for audience sharing, but there will be um, an opportunity to share at the end of our agenda as well. So at this time, we're going to head to new business. And that brings us to the principal's report, as well as our ZPTO presentation. Um, so principal souls, I'm going to hand it off to you for our principal's report. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start with an update from Melican. Uh, Michelle has to uh, offer that her the math curriculum leader is working with Trottier curriculum um, and the Algonquin math department head to examine math teaching practices, uh, math placement protocols, and math resources. The grade 6 to 12 collaboration is being led by math curriculum coordinator Mary Coakley. The work has been ongoing, and there is also a professional development day scheduled to focus on this work this particular Friday. Our guidance counselors continue to deliver lessons to students in the classrooms. Focus areas include diversity and bias, self-regulation, time management, mindfulness, and mental health. Students have been receptive to the lessons, willing to share and actively engage in conversation, and have been able to utilize what they are learning across curriculum areas. Our sixth, seventh, and eighth graders are snowshoeing this week during physical education classes. Students are enjoying this exciting outdoor activity. Our student council is leading a sock drive to support Net of Compassion in Worcester. To date, they've collected nearly 1,100 pairs of socks. The drive runs through February 8th and is also a friendly competition between students and staff. We have connected this initiative with the Northboro Community Affairs helping create a community in which we are all treated with kindness and respect. Our student council also initiated homeroom door decorating contests in December. The first one was called Frosty Feud. Each of our 53 home run, homerooms excuse me, received the same supplies and were tasked with creating a snow person to be displayed on the doors. This month's theme is Knock on Cupid's Door. Judges choose the top three doors per floor and then the top three overall. Winners receive a small prize and bragging rights. These friendly competitions generate school spirit, teamwork, and promote important connections between students and staff. Students are creating Valentines for veterans for the Coleman House uh, residents. These Valentines will be delivered to the veteran shelter on Grove Street in Worcester and Coleman House in Northboro on February 11th. Our seventh grade students celebrated middle of the middle this week the middle of the year for the middle grade of the middle school. If you got that, <laughs> activities included an images poetry contest for ELA, Lunar New Year activities in social studies, and a snow build in science. The snow build involved a team planning period, two class periods to build. Students enjoyed this mini celebration, especially the opportunity to play in the snow. 24 eighth graders had their in-person interviews for ACEBET this week. Although several of these students will not attend ACEBET in the fall, this live interview experience was a wonderful opportunity for these students to take risks and practice their interviewing skills. Next Tuesday, Algonquin will hold its virtual course selection meeting for eighth grade students and parents on February 15th. And for the Northboro Elementary Schools, um, we have some highlights in our curriculum areas. Kathy Lazat has been working within the four elementary schools to support teachers with the continued work with student math data. She has been a great support to principals and has spent time conducting walkthroughs with those principals. Weekly math updates are shared with teachers weekly to highlight resources and strategies that teachers can use. These updates have been well received by all staff members. 
in the area of um, ELA, we've been working a lot with Dibbles. The elementary schools, reading specialists, and classroom teachers have worked with students across grades kindergarten through second in order to administer the winter Dibbles assessment. The leadership of our reading specialists and Megan Kelty has been greatly appreciated in administering and collecting this data. Grade level teams will be working together to analyze. Sorry. We'll be working uh, together to administer and collect the data, um, the data and the plan for literacy instructions and intervention. Um, within our EL program, um, both our EL uh, coordinators uh, throughout the district, uh, several of them are working on access testing, and they have begun this for our students and will continue testing through the extended deadline of March 31st. The elementary schools will be celebrating Black History Month through read-alouds, highlighting the contributions of Black scientists, writers, artists, artists, et cetera. In the area of community service, the elementary schools are participating in Kindness Week um, that has been mentioned earlier. Students and staff will be engaging in activities related to bucket filling, lessons connected to empathy and kindness, and making our schools and community a brighter place. We are joining the initiative brought forward by the North Community Affairs Committee. Their aim is to create a community in which we all are treated with kindness and respect. Z is supporting the Bay Path Humane Society in Hopkinton during this Kindness Week. We are also extending this uh, donation drive to the community, um, so beyond our schools. We are also spreading kindness um, by completing a heart and sharing words of kindness and kindness acts within the school. In a student focused area, the fifth grade chorus and band students across the elementary schools had their winter concerts. They were recorded in the schools um, and presented in virtual sessions. Z held their virtual presentation last night. We are appreciative of this partnership with the NCAT in bringing our students hard work to families in the coming weeks being via that concert webinar. The Proctor School will be supporting the American Heart Association through the Kids Heart Challenge. Students will be jumping and supporting heart health while raising funds for the American Heart Association during the week of February 14th through 18th. Peasley just wrapped up their January Spirit Drive. Students celebrated Crazy Hair Day and Northboro Food Pantry Drive. Students are looking forward to our Share the Love Spirit Day. Students will be wearing red or pink and engage in activities to spread kindness and friendship. At Lincoln Street, physical education classes will be participating in Global School Play Day 2022. During the week of January 31st through the 4th, this is a day of awareness promoting the importance of regular unstructured play for the best development of children. Our hope is that this one day of play will inspire kids to plan for more unstructured playtime during their non-school hours. Lincoln Street is also kicking off their sixth annual Super Bowl to benefit the Northboro Food Pantry. They are using the energy around our nation's largest sporting events to inspire youth to fight hunger and poverty. Students develop a stronger connection to the community as they collect food for the hungry and show compassion to those in need. Z has partnered with the Boston um, versus Bullies program for grades four and five, and the My Face Wonder Project for grades K to three um, for an anti-bullying presentation for our grades K to five. The fourth and fifth graders have had two 45 minute virtual presentations, while K to three will meet this Friday for a presentation modeled after the book, We Are All Wonders by R.J. Palacio. Each grade span will enjoy a 45 minute presentation and take the My Face Upstander Pledge. Z has also kicked off a month long read along readathon. This is a PTO fundraiser that pairs raising money with inspiring students to read and listen to books. The work is supported by our families and our staff members. For the week of February 14th, the Z staff and students will show their love for school spirit, wearing their stripes, Valentine's Day by wearing red, love for our nurses, especially Mrs. Berger, and your favorite team, wearing spirit wear, and our love for comfort, wearing pajamas on Friday. So that's our principal update. 
Thank you so much, Principal Souls. Uh, before we head to our PTO presentation, I just wanted to know if there are any questions or comments from any uh, school committee members. Yes, Joan. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I think this is just a general question, maybe um, either Amy can answer it or Greg. Is that on, and Amy, that I maybe I think it's up to Greg because this deals with the middle school. On February 15th, you talked about that the middle school is going to have a course selection for parents. And I wanted to know that at that time, would there be any staff from Algonquin Regional High School coming down to give the highlights of some of the, of the depth and the breadth of the courses that we offer to the students? Yes, yeah, so Keith, do you want to speak to, um, as the former principal of Trottier School, I think you can kind of describe the process. Yeah, so Joan, absolutely. The high school is involved uh, intricately with the course selection. I know that uh, Principal Bevan, Principal Carb, and Principal Hershek have been working on that and making the adjustments uh, po possible with, with COVID and the restrictions. Uh, but yes, uh, Algonquin does have a very key role in that and how and then how that information is collected. So it is genuinely a collaboration between the three schools. And then a follow up to that, um, if you would happen to know, is there any time that we have the music department, sports, some of the extracurricular activities such as the robotic team? I know that the eighth graders are so excited to be on their next uh, journey and to be in high school, but I think it's so rich what we have at Algonquin Regional that we can hit so many interests of kids with intramurals and that. Do they come down and explain also those activities to the kids that they can partake in at another time? Yeah, historically, absolutely. That that process usually happens later in the school year. I also think they've made some adjustments with COVID, so I don't know if it's uh, an in-person or a virtual opportunity, but I know it does exist where they do those introductions, especially for the clubs and activities that are available at Algonquin. Okay, thank you. And Lauren, I just have one, it's not a question, but just a comment. Absolutely. Um, I, I would just like to say that, you know, we're going to be looking at, uh, into our superintendent's report to the committee and voting on the budget. I would just like to say in the past months, especially in January, February, some of the recent hires that have been there from the reading specialists to math and everything and all the support people that we have in the academics has been really highlighted through the principal reports. Mm -hmm. And you hear the names very often spoke. So it's, it, it is wonderful to hear through the principal's reports, the wonderful things that the additional personnel staff in the academics have reached out to our students and also to the staff. So kudos to Greg and his administration for, for pushing forward to get those positions and making it such a good, rich education for our students and staff. Thank you. Thanks, Joan. Um, Principal Souls, I thought it was really interesting hearing about the free day of play in our ever digital world. It's wonderful to encourage kids to be kids and to lay yeah. off the technology and really just to use their imagination and, and connect with one another. Um, so is, did you say that that's happening across all elementary schools or one, one in particular? Uh, it's happening at Lincoln Street, but as a principal and reading the updates um, over the last couple of days as the principals added to the list, it's certainly something I put on my list um, to access future for, for, we should be doing it for all schools. That's wonderful. And I think that the collaboration and the sharing during the principal's reports is great for principals to get ideas from each other. So thank yeah. you for that collaboration. Yes, thank you. Um, so um, Principal Souls, um, I would like, if possible, if you could introduce our ZPTO board members who are here tonight and we can um, start off with that presentation. Absolutely. I will give you their names and then I will let them introduce themselves in terms of their uh, children that they have at Z and all the great work that they do. But um, of course we have, these are our co-chairs of PTO. Um, Rebecca Mahopoulos has been um, part of the PTO for the last few years um, in the chair position. Um, and um, Betsy Anderson has come on board uh, this particular year in the role of a co-chair um, to assume responsibilities next year. And they have been a fabulous duo, um, lots of creative ideas. Um, so looking forward to their presentation as they highlight a lot of great work that they've done um, in this COVID uh, pandemic uh, last year and this year. Um, it's been absolutely amazing that they just keep pushing forward and doing great things for the community and our students. 
So very much appreciated, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Rebecca and Bessie, you. Uh, whenever you're ready to start, we welcome your presentation. All right. Can I share my screen? Because I have like, I have a PowerPoint, would you that should, be okay? You should be all set, Rebecca. Okay. Everyone see that? All right. Great, thank you. So as Principal Soul said, um, I'm Rebecca Mahopoulos and I've been uh, involved with the PTO as chair for, this is my third year. Um, and it's been a wonderful experience. Um, very fortunate to have a great team around me as well. Um, Betsy Anderson is joining tonight too. So we're gonna split up the presentation. Um, I have a third grade boy at Etsy in Mrs. Grady's class and then a kindergartner at Z as well um, in Mrs. Rubin's class. Um, so the ZPTO, um, the ba basically what we do is we work to bring quality programming to enhance student learning and we provide experiences that really go beyond the classroom. We also plan specific events that bring our Z community together and we demonstrate appreciation for our teachers and staff, um, which have gone above and beyond. We are so grateful for them. Lastly, we strive to create a really strong relationship between the administration, the teachers, the staff, families, and students. Um, uh, we have uh, a board of four, so um, my, myself and Betsy as the chair and co-chair, and then we have treasurer Kristen Guai with a student in third grade and secretary Diana Longden with a child in first grade and third grade. So we have a, young, a board on the younger side, which is great because we know where they'll be around for a while for our institutional knowledge, which is always really important uh, going forward. Um, we also have a lot of PTO leadership roles. Um, we really have tried to um, expand our leadership roles in the last few years uh, to help split the work up. Um, we've also made it a concerted effort to ask new parents to get involved and also parents who haven't been asked before. We find that when people are directly asked, they typically feel really appreciated and say yes to doing something. So I think it's just, we've really put it out there as asking different people and thinking about what their expertise may be. Um, so thinking thoughtfully about that. And we have a great group of workers, doers, um, we are so fortunate. We meet um, every month as a full PTO and all parents are invited to attend. Um, when necessary, we do form subcommittees as well. So right now we have just uh, started the Kids Fest planning committee, subcommittee. Um, and we realize not all parents can take on such a role such as this. So we appreciate anything people can do and there are plenty of ways to other ways to get involved from donating food items for the teacher appreciation luncheon to buying tickets at kids fest so it runs the gamut and everything parents can do um, is appreciated so we are going to now move toward our budget um, so this year our approved budget is fourteen thousand eight hundred dollars it is um, quite a bit down because of the pandemic. It's about $10,000 less because we haven't been able to do hold our largest fundraiser, which is Kids Fest um, and does include a silent auction. Uh, we are planning to have it this year and I can't tell you how excited we all are to have a outdoor Kids Fest if things go right. So fingers and toes are crossed, um, but we've made it work. We've been really creative and being made it work with a smaller budget. Um, so we, let's see, the largest portion of our budget goes to enrichment, which um, makes a lot of sense. That's why we do what we do. Um, we have $5,000 allocated for that. Um, our, the, the other two large portions of the budget are for academic grants and classroom grants. 
So classroom grants are for teachers and specialists to buy some extra classroom supplies. We know it does get expensive for them. And then the academic grants are for, are submitted by teachers and specialists um, throughout the year to enhance classroom learning. So as these, they see these um, needs arise. Um, and we have a rolling grant cycle. So at each of our meetings, um, monthly meetings, we usually have at least one grant submission that we discuss and decide um, whether or not to approve. Um, we also have money allocated for plenty of other things such as our spirit events, staff appreciation, kindergarten orientation, and um, other, other pieces of the pie, but I won't bore you with all those details. We'll get into some more interesting things that we do. Um, so our enrichment programs. So we have two fantastic enrichment coordinators this year. They're brand new um, to this role, Christine Lab and Jen Antonellis. And Jen's actually a brand new parent at Z. Um, so, and they're doing an amazing job. We are um, very excited to be able to get back to some in-school enrichment this year. Um, we, and the students and teachers were so delighted for it too. Um, we've had, we brought in the Discovery Museum, their traveling STEM workshops um, for each grade and the topic aligns with what they're learning in science. So each grade was learn something um, different. I got to observe the, the sound um, workshop with the first grade, the kindergartners and then the first graders and the uh, force and magnetism with the third graders. Um, it's just been delightful to see the hands-on learning and um, having a different perspective, someone from the outside come in. It's, it's um, really fun and exciting learning for them. So um, our final workshop actually was postponed because of January issues. So our final workshop's happening next week for the fourth graders and that's the lights and lasers. Um, we're also continuing to do um, some virtual enrichment programming too. Um, I think one of the silver linings of the pandemic is that we can do these things and make them affordable. We've had a lot of like free programming because they have been able to be virtual has been an option. So we had um, Channel 5 meteorologist um, come um, virtual visit for the third graders and they were learning about weather in December. And um, we're actually engaging in some enrichment program for the entire school around anti-bullying this year. Um, I believe, yeah, Principal Souls already mentioned we, we've started these programs. Um, Boston Bull the Boston Bully Anti-Bullying presentation is a three-part presentation which started for, which is for fourth and fifth grade and started last Friday. And it's sponsored by the Sports Museum um, and the, well, it's not sponsored, it's run, I'm sorry, by the Sports Museum and the Boston Sports Community to Stand Strong Against Bullying. And it's actually a free program um, that New Balance and uh, the Highland Street Foundation have been able to bring to schools and after school programs. And the first one went, went really well. We're looking forward to the other two. And then for the younger grades, K through um, three, uh, we are bringing in the Wonder Project, which actually is happening this Friday, again, virtually. Um, and we are looking forward to that. It's really about the goal of the My Face Wonder Project is to provide students with tools they need to be an upstander and unite against bullying. And um, they're gonna learn to choose kindness and make a big difference in the lives of others. So it actually also goes along with Kindness Week, which is starting next week. Um, and then in March, we're gonna be bringing in special guest author, Josh Funk um, for um, interactive presentations for each grade. Um, and it's his, his focus is gonna be on his coding books. Um, and we're really excited about that visit. And then other visits we um, typically do are the Sled Dogs Iditarod program. We're hoping to bring them back this year for the second and third graders. 
um, Animal Adventures, um, Pumpernickel Puppets. These are always popular enrichment programs and we may be expanding to do, we're, we're still brainstorming. There may be others coming in too. Um, and then our PTO sponsored events, we range from um, teacher appreciation events to school spirit and Z community building events to community service events and activities. So we've been really grateful to bring back our beloved outdoor family events such as the Mount Pisgah storybook hike. Uh, you can see a picture of us all there um, at Mount Pisgah. Uh, we read a story along the way. Our librarian and our phys ed teacher pair up to do this event, which is really cute and a great way to get out there um, on the weekend with the, with the families. Uh, we also do a monthly walk bike to school, school days. Um, you can see a picture of the kids there too. Um, we also held a wonderful, our first back to school picnic this year, which featured guest Smiley from the Woo Sox. So that was really fun. Brought in a um, food truck, um, pizzas. So it was a really fun outdoor way for us to safely gather. Um, we've also had some successful food drives this year benefiting the North Grove Food Pantry, as well as the Worcester County Food Pantry, and we're about to start an animal shelter collection drive. Um, so those are some of the PTO sponsored events that we've done so far this year, and we will continue to plan and be creative and hope for good weather. <laughs> and now I'm gonna hand it over to Betsy to finish out the presentation. Hi there, my name is Betsy and I have two boys at Z, one in kindergarten in Miss Barry's class and the other in second grade in Miss Johnson's class and we have loved being at Z. Um, being a part of the PTO has been wonderful. Um, I've really enjoyed it. And I'm gonna continue the presentation by starting to talk about the academic grants. Um, we accept these grants on a rolling basis, which was mentioned before. Um, and the teachers have until June to submit these grants. So far this year, the PTO has supported such grants mm -hmm. as new soccer nets, Elkanon boxes for the first grade, which helps them, uh, which helps the teachers teach reading sounds as multi-sensory approach. Um, we've approved a um, set supplies for a play that the third grade puts on um, through library, um, which actually just happened yesterday. Um, my second grader was able to watch that and he said he loved the presentation and the play that they put on. So, um, and then we also approved some sensory needs um, that were used for the occupational therapists within the school. And teachers are also given the opportunity to submit $50 worth of supplies for PTO to reimburse them throughout the year as well. They also have to June to submit these. And then in terms of fundraisers, um, raising funds is an important part of how we're able to run these activities that Rebecca mentioned earlier. And to date, we've held six fundraisers, um, Boone Supply Fundraiser, School Pictures, Best Books Book Fair. We've held a Muya Restaurant Night, Fall Spirit Wear, and Donate a Bag Soul Warming Soup Fundraiser. Our best books book fair actually had the highest amount of sales um, in over four years, um, which was really exciting for us. And then another way that we collect funds is by having a direct donation. And we typically start this campaign in December for families to ensure that they can participate in company matched donations before the year end. This is an open-ended donation process, and we have raised $575 during this year's campaign, campaign so far. Um, and one of our parents, we were very lucky, um, actually works for a fundraising company, and she was able to help mm -hmm. us create a um, flyer and um, help to get that out to the families of Z and help us to create funds for that. So we were very appreciative to her about that. Our second largest fundraiser of the year, which is the Readathon, just kicked off uh, yesterday. Um, and that is going to run, as Principal Souls mentioned, um, throughout most of the month of February. 
And then in late April and early May, um, our Kids Fest, which has historically been our biggest fundraiser, um, has started our process of planning at this point. And our Kids Fest consists of games for kids to play, face painting, a cakewalk, bouncy houses, food, and a silent auction. The fifth graders at Z get to choose the theme. And last Kids Fest theme was space. The art classes throughout the school uh, create artwork on that theme for decorations for our event. And the last Kids Fest in 2019 brought over in over $10,000. 7,000 of that was generated from the silent auction. And as Rebecca mentioned earlier, we're super excited to hold our first Kids Fest in three years and hope to continue a fun family event for all. And then I did just wanna finish up with how we communicate with our families. And for the ZPTO, communication is a big part of creating a strong Z community. So we use multiple outlets to be in touch with as many families as possible. We have increased our Facebook presence this year. Um, we have continued to send out a PTO newsletter at the beginning of each year to inform families of the planned activities, enrichments throughout the year, meetings that we'll hold um, for the year. And this year we added um, defined positions within the PTO. Um, we felt as though that would help to bring families in and be able to tap into their individualized skills and hopefully get more families to participate within the PTO. Um, the PTO also has an opportunity at the kindergarten orientation to welcome new families to Z and talk a little bit about the PTO and what we do and how we help the school and the students. And Rebecca, I'm gonna hand it back over to you to just say thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone for hearing our presentation. All right, yes, thank you. And one other thing we've, I think another silver lining of the pandemic, we've found that we have been collaborating more than ever with the other three um, um, elementary schools here in Northborough, which has been a great. Um, last year, we were all in it together and we've kind of continued that communication, bouncing ideas off each other, best practices. So that's been really wonderful um, to have the support of the other PTOs. And um, that's all we have tonight, but we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Rebecca and Betsy, for your presentation tonight and for all your dedication to all the students at, D, at Z School. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Erin. Do you have a question or comment? Thanks, guys, for presenting. I know how much hard work you put into it. Can you tell me a little bit more about your Kids Fest? Are you hiring companies to come in? Are you guys doing it all yourself? Have you picked a date? So we've picked a tentative date, as long as things go in the right direction. It will be Friday, April 29th. Um, and we've um, been in collaboration with Crystal Entertainment um, to come and put on the games because they're much better than the games that <laughs> we come up with. Um, and we were going to use them prior to in 2020. So we are going to, we're excited to bring them on to um, help us make this very successful. Great. Sounds good. Good job, guys. Thanks, Erin. I see the collaboration already happening here in this meeting. <laughs> Aaron's getting ideas. <laughs> um, Joan. Uh, thanks, Lauren. I'd just like to thank both Betsy and Rebecca. And if you can take our most generous uh, and gracious thanks back to all the members and the parents that helped so much. Um, it seems like the PTO is definitely a 24 seven operation. Um, I don't think you're taking any summer months off because you have to do all your planning during that time. And you have done so, for the Z School, you've done so many wonderful enrichment programs and hitting so many academic areas and also uh, things that are fun for kids to do. And you have shown through your endurance and, and your time that you put in that this has still succeeded through the pandemic. And it was nice to hear how 
in this time, you have worked with the other PTOs. And I think that just shows the good collaboration. And it is one of, the, I think the most, the PTOs are one of the most positive things I think that we have going in our Northboro community. It's always been there, but I think you're even enriching it even more. Um, and I definitely, you know, teachers, I think all the way across the United States are always spending so much of their own money to put in the classroom. And I was glad to see that you are, you know, as all schools do, that you're giving grant money to the teachers in the amount of $50. Betsy, I had a question for you because you mentioned all the, um, the grant amounts, I mean, not the grant amounts, the, the titles of the grants that are coming out. Um, mm -hmm. And what you guys do just helps us in our budget season because these would be other things that would, would be in our regular um, operational budget, but you're helping us out so much in what you provide. Do you have a total amount for that grant amount that you have given out so far, or what is your goal to spend each year? I do not have the amount that we have spent thus far, Rebecca. Do you have that total in front of you? Um, let me see if I do. We oh, yeah, thank you for the question, Joan. We allocate four thousand dollars for the academic grants, so the rolling grant cycle. Um, I we have it, we've spent. I know we've spent um, more than what I'm seeing on my budget because this is the budget from last meet, meeting, and we had a lot of receipts just come in. Mm -hmm. So I cannot answer that, but I can definitely email you the answer to that question, Joan. Okay, thanks, Rebecca. I mean, $4,000 is is wonderful. And is this an ongoing, ongoing rolling grant cycle? So let's say if a teacher goes to a course and hears about something that they would like to institute in science or social studies in their class, can they apply for a grant in March or April? Yes, it, yep, it goes Every through month. June. Oh, yeah, sorry. every month before the PTO meeting, I send out an email reminding people that we have a PTO meeting coming up, and that's when I share the grants. So every month, the teachers have the ability to submit grants. It's on a rolling basis through through the end of the school year. That's fine because you know the teachers take so many courses for mm -hmm. their certification, and you hear about some of these things that they do, like in February vacation or April vacation, and they have all this energy ready to go, and they go like. I got to wait till next year and see and apply. So I'm glad to hear that this is a rolling cycle and the teachers can apply anytime for these grants. Thank you very much. Kudos to all of you, Amy. Thanks for working so well with your PTO and I, you have a great you have a great coordina coordination going there. So and Betsy and Rebecca, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Greg. So Rebecca and Betsy, thank you for the very informative presentation. It's always amazing how much our PTOs bring to our schools. So thank you for volunteering your time and expertise. And I just wanna comment on your succession planning. Um, it's always nice to hear that you have um, future leaders and uh, Rebecca and I know Aaron and, and Kelly are, are leaders in the PTO and they're always recruiting people to take on leadership roles. So um, thank you, Betsy, for, for stepping up and, and being an advocate on behalf of the students. My pleasure. I'm just trying to find someone to step into my portion for next year. <laughs> and Betsy and Rebecca, thank you for all of your work. Um, I know one thing that stood out to me was the um, Discovery Museum presentations. Um, I know that those are sort of a fan favorite. Um, as a science teacher myself, I have um, participated in those programs with my own students and um, they're just always so great to see the students doing hands-on activities. So the fact that your PTO can bring these opportunities to our students is wonderful. Uh, so thank you so much for being here tonight and for spending your Wednesday night with the, with the school committee. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. You are more than welcome to join us for the rest of our meeting. However, if you do have other obligations, we totally understand. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Principal Souls, thank you as well for the principal's report. Good night, Amy. <laughs> um, right, I'm, so, I'm oh, pardon. Greg, did you have something to say? I'm just going to um, promote or demote Rebecca and Betsy back to attendees. So just give me one second. Absolutely. This is when a demotion is actually probably preferred. <laughs> I 
me one second. Sure. And Amy, you are unmuted just to let you know. <laughs> Rebecca, it's not letting me move you back into um, the audience, so. Just leave. <laughs> OK, okay sounds yeah, good. So <laughs> even rejoin as an attendee. And Amy, it's your, I think it's up to you if you want to stay for the entire meeting or if you want to begin your evening. Um, that is your call. Yes, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so our next item of new business is a legislative update of which there is none at this time. So we'll move on to our next item, which is the MSBA Accelerated Repair Program. Um, and so um, Superintendent Martineau will give us um, some information about a potential statement of interest for the Proctor School roof. Thank you, Greg. Sure, so the Massachusetts School Building Authority opened its window um, this past Friday, January 28th, um, to accept statements of interest for its accelerated repair program. And as the committee knows, the accelerated repair program really centers around replacing windows, roofs and boiler systems. Um, and earlier in the year, the operational I mean, the capital planning committee met with um, Assistant Superintendent LaVoy and uh, Mr. Richardson to talk about what are the high priority projects. And as a result, um, we decided to move forward the Proctor roof as a um, priority project. Um, so Keith has been working on the statement of interest um, to submit through MSBA's website and as part of that process, we need a um, support of two boards, the school committee and the board of selectmen. Um, so this evening, we are uh, looking for a vote uh, from the committee um, to support the submission of a statement of interest. And then we'll be working with the town uh, select board to also get its support um, in terms of moving the statement of interest forward. I have had conversations with John Kader, um, and he is in fully support of um, submitting the statement as well as the select board. I also have a uh, very specific language um, in terms of a vote. So I will share my screen so that um, any member who wants to make a motion can read the motion on the screen. But before I do that, um, uh, I we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Um, question. So when, what is the time frame of it? Um, I know that it's opened for it, but do they wait until, is it like a rolling type thing? Kind of how like the Z does it with grants or is it like here it's opened and here's the deadline and then you find out and you get the money. Like, are there specific dates? Yeah. So the, there's a window when they, um, the MSBA board, uh, accept statements of interest, and I believe that closes at the end of March. Um, and then at its quarterly board meetings, it will review uh, potential projects. I imagine that we'll hear one way or the other um, this fall whether MSBA would accept North Bros application um, for the accelerated repair project. Um, and again, I, I expect probably November um, at that point in time we'd, we'd hear. Oh, wow. Okay. Takes about a year and a half of uh, time frame from being accepted and completion of a project. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Joan? Uh, Greg, my question is also on the timeline, piggyback on what Kelly had to say. So you said that it would be a year and a half. So let's say we do get approved. Would that be that in 20? 23 would you be would we be doing the roof project and would that occur in the summertime so that it's not disruptive to any of the students and staff yeah i mean it's hard to tell depending on kind of the msba's process um most likely it would be funded in fy24 um because again we'd be in, in a new fiscal year and i've had again conversations with john Cadera around um, securing the funds for that project from the town side. 
Um, so it is, it is not a quick process, but again, reimbursement is significant um, and it is worth um, the time and energy for a community to partner with MSBA in these types of projects. Okay, thank you. So you're looking at FY24? Correct. Um, and Greg, given your experience with um, projects through this program, um, I guess I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, like the chances of being accepted from your experience and, you know, if we are not accepted into this accelerated program, then what would the trajectory be for uh, repairing the roof? Yeah, so I think it depends on each cycle and each window statement of interests are open and how many districts apply. I think that there's a minimum threshold in which projects will be reviewed. Um, the Proctor Roof does meet that threshold. And you know, I'm fairly confident that uh, North Grove has a, an excellent chance of being invited in. I think the project has merit. If we do not, if we are not invited in, um, you know, I think the school committee will, will need to, and town will need to make a decision around um, if we can wait another cycle um, in another couple of years before we make repairs to the Proctor roof. Um, and that contingency, contingency plan would really um, require a, a partnership with the town um, and the school department. And we've had some initial conversations about that already. Okay, thank you. Um, I know when the um, specialist came in, uh, I believe it was at the beginning of the school year, um, to recommend um, some mitigation measures for Proctor. The roof was of utmost importance to prevent mold in the future. Um, so hopefully, you know, this will go through. And if not, um, I have confidence that the town and the schools can, can work together to um, solve this quickly. And I'll just comment um, that um, Lauren, if I may, just also, I think at the, the March school committee meeting, um, uh, Keith can provide an update on some of the work we've done around the mitigation efforts to make sure that um, drainage is, is happening properly and um, some of the mitigation efforts that we're putting into play um, this spring. Um, and that does give us some more confidence that we, we do have a little bit more time than we had originally thought. Um, based on some of the mitigation efforts that will take place later in the spring and early summer. That would be great to have that at our March meeting. Great recommendation, thank you. I don't see any other comments or questions. So Greg, if you could share your screen and anyone um, who feels to make a motion, it looks like Kelly, you're first to, um, <laughs> Are you ready for this, Kelly? <laughs> it's a long one. <laughs> we have to have I'm, some legal language here. <laughs> I'm ready. I can't see. All right, go Hold for on. it. Hold on. I can't see my my thing is a uh, bit the window. Okay. So, what, what, what am I reading? <laughs> am I reading just the highlight, or I'm reading the whole no, paragraph? So you're reading the entire. Okay. Entire the section. whole paragraph. Yep. Um. So I motion, right? And then I say that, okay. So I'd like to make a motion um, to vote authorization for the superintendent to submit the statement of interest to the MSBA. Uh, having convened an open meeting on February 2nd, 2022, prior to the SIO, SOI submission closing date, the school committee of North Grove, in accordance with its chapter bylaws and ordinance has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority a statement of interest form dated February 2nd, 2022 for the Fannie E. Proctor Elementary School located at 26 Jefferson Road, which describes and explains the following deficiencies and the priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future for replacement of the EPDM roofing system under priority number five, the replacement of the 40,000 square foot roof system is necessarily due to its age, ruptured seams, punctured membranes and water damage. 
and hereby further specifically acknowledge that by the submitting this statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or approval of the application, the awarding of grants or any other funding committed from the Massachusetts School Building Authorities or commits the town of Northborough to file an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Second. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, for the motion. And Joan I did not think second. it was going to be that long. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any further questions or discussion? All right. Oh, Erin. Oh, no, done? sorry. Okay. Uh, then we will take a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Frank? Yes. Ms. Gannett? Yes. Ms. Tagliaferri? Yes. And myself, Lauren Bailey Jones, is yes. It passes unanimously. And Lauren, I just thank would like you. to thank Keith Lavoie for um, you know, the window opened on Friday and we were rushing to get all the paperwork for this meeting. So thank you, Keith. You're welcome. Thank you. We appreciate it. Um, and hopefully we will hear some updates soon about how this process goes. Thank you. You're welcome, absolutely. Our next order of new business is a professional, develop uh, a professional development update from Dr. Reinhorn. Um, and so she will be giving us um, an update about some professional development um, for an upcoming um, day, which I believe falls on March 21st. Dr. Reinhorn, thanks so much for your update. Sure, thank you for the opportunity. I am going to share my screen and I just have a few slides to keep me organized. Okay, so uh, you are correct, Lauren, that our professional development day that is coming up is on March 21st. And this is what we um, often refer to as a district professional development day. Our professional development day in November was a school-based professional development day, and it was organized at the level of the schools, whereas our March uh, 21st is um, organized at the level of the district. And I want to first thank our professional development committee, which has representatives um, from all of the schools, from all different disciplines, um, administrative team, the associations, and is a really important element of planning for any of our professional development. Um, the offerings that we will have at the District Professional Development Day are aligned to Vision 2026 and or school improvement plans. And the way we organize it is that there are a set of offerings, but then educators make choices about how to direct their own learning for the day from within those choices. And there are two basic formats um, for the offerings. There are workshops, which are either outside presenters or um, our own internal people who are basically facilitating um, an opportunity where they are bringing some expertise, sharing that expertise, giving people an opportunity to learn and apply that learning. And we have partnerships, which are really about groups of our own educators working together in their learning um, and applying their learning to their ongoing work. So what I'd like to do is just give you some, a sample of some of the offerings. There are actually um, more than what I'm gonna share, but we are in the process right now of getting all of the offerings organized, and then we will be putting them, um, They've are, people have already heard about and then proposed additional offerings, and now we're they're back and we are, as a committee, putting it all together then we'll be putting it back out and so that individuals can sign up for the specific ones. So just to give you a sense of the types of things, um, aligned to our strategic objective about empowering learners, we will have a workshop on universal design for learning, which will be with an outside facilitator from Novak Educational Consulting. We have um, at least two different math offerings, one at the elementary level about math talk, um, and at the middle school level, as you heard in Principal Carb's update, uh, there are middle school educators who are working with Mary Copley on looking at resources um, at the middle school level. 
um, a lot of different work going on related to digital literacy and computer science standards and learning those standards and applying that to our work. Um, there will be a workshop offered by Dot Lucci um, related to executive functioning, and that will focus on fifth grade and up um, and how in integrating executive functioning into the general education classroom. There will also be um, a workshop related to early literacy instructional practices and, um, the, and basically teaching reading. Um, we have a group of world language teachers who will be working with the new world language frameworks and learning more about those and how they impact our world language classes. We'll have work with the new WIDA standards. Um, and there, again, are more topics related to empowering learners, but that gives you a flavor. In alignment to our strategic objective, objective equity of opportunity, um, these are a few of the offerings. One is that um, some consultants from the Anti-Defamation League will be coming and continuing our learning at the secondary level with um, the title of their workshop is Transformative Approaches to Social and Racial Justice in Our Schools. And that will be extending the learning that our secondary educators have already been doing with ADL this year. Um, a group of our own educators will be offering a workshop um, related to Zaretta Hammond's work around culturally responsive teaching. Uh, we have so, quite a few groups that are doing work related to windows and mirrors. Some of the groups are looking at curriculum units and revising those units, such as in English language arts that is happening. Other groups are looking at a combination of curriculum and resources and instructional practices. We have groups in music, in art, in library. We have some multidisciplinary groups of specialists doing that type of work. Uh, there's offerings related to inclusion and inclusionary practices related to the writing of IEPs, uh, related to um, our educational support professionals and their um, a range of opportunities to develop their skills. Uh, digital assessment tools that are new this year and continuing our learning around um, how we use and implement those tools. Expanding and developing our practices using Orton Gillingham, and that's being offered by some of our internal educators who have a lot of expertise in that area. And finally, in the area of healthy and balanced learners, um, there, one of a local psychologist is going to be doing a workshop related to mindfulness, resilience, and post traumatic growth beyond the COVID crisis. We will be offering mental health first aid or mental health 101. Um, we're going to have some work led by Mary Ellen Duggan and some of her colleagues around assessing and aligning our health curriculum, which is the beginning or not the beginning, it's kind of the middle of the road of a lot of work that will be ongoing. It's not a one day project. Um, several different groups are working with the Castle competencies, continuing their learning about those competencies and applying that both in general education, specialists, and in some of our guidance departments. Um, there's also work happening in our guidance departments, reviewing and aligning counseling practices and uh, the ways that we support social emotional learning, SEL. And final example, um, occupational therapy. There's um, our group of our occupational therapists coming together to look at their practices and review and alignment of those practices. And as I said, this isn't even all of them. So um, one of the things that's really exciting for March 21st is uh, the range of opportunities so that people can really think about where they are as individual learners, um, or as groups of learners, which is mostly what they do is working in teams and um, what their best next step is. And I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for the update, Dr. Reinhorn. It's wonderful to see all the different offerings um, for the professional development coming up in March. Um, it looks like we do have some questions and comments. I'm gonna start it off with Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. <clears throat> so all of that is being offered and then potentially even more on top of that, you're saying? Or, are, yeah. or some of those might not happen? 
No, those are all happening. Those are all happening. Um, and then even But more the reason so. it's, it sounds like so much. It does. It's the <laughs> reason, I know it does. But the, the thing to remember about it is one of those things, for example, is something that's happening with our occupational therapists. That's 10 people, okay. right? Another one of them might be something that is happening with um, 10 art teachers, Okay. Right. So, you know, when we, this is across all and three districts, you're talking about over 700 educators. Okay. Um, so there are a lot and of different pieces, but hopefully what you could see there is the ways that they connect to the bigger threads of yeah. the work we're doing around healthy and balanced learners, equity of opportunity, empowering learners. Um, but so those are all being offered. Yes. So is it like it's a seven hour day or whatever, eight hour day? And so those three sections, would it be broken up like, you know, two, four, six hours, like for each thing, or is like each thing blocks during an hour or it's all random or I'm sure. Great you question. I just think it's very fascinating. So yeah, great question. Uh, the way we're doing it this year is people are selecting one focus area for the day. So if they're doing mindfulness and resilience, um, they're doing that for the day. It will include component, you know, parts of the day might be more where they're um, learning some new information about mindfulness and post-traumatic stress, and then parts of the day might be applying it to their own work. So they'll obviously break the day up into different parts. It might be whole group and then broken into smaller groups, um, but it is a day-long experience for whatever they're doing. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Joan. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reinhardt, for this wonderful presentation. And I was pleased to see that the professional development is being tied into what we have as this, our strategic plan. I know through the, under the helm of Greg as superintendent and you and your, with your tenure, and also uh, with uh, Superintendent Johnson. And this is not a document that we just compile and it sits on the shelf and we look at it in five years. It, it, it's, it's a very living, vital document. And I'm glad to see that you're bringing that in also in the professional development, which I would not expect nothing but the, these great things to happen. Um, I wanted to know, because of the richness of these, is there a way that you are providing from this, this one day workshop, is there a means of teachers to put those hours and combine them with maybe a course that they're taking for their certification or to renew their licenses because you have to have so many hours in the discipline. So are we providing something to our staff so they can show what they have done so that can you know put those cumulative hours together to make a, a segment for their certification? Yes, that is one of the things. Um, that's a great question, Joan. Um, that you definitely understand well from your own experience. And um, that is something that the Professional Development Committee has talked a lot about and is focused on. The, as our professional development has evolved over the years, there have been times when the way we're organized is more aligned and other times when it's less aligned. One of the things we did this with uh, for this professional development day is, um, there are two categories that teachers have to get 15 PDPs, 15 hours um, related to, essentially related to sheltered English immersion or English language learners. And then there's another 15 related to um, diverse learners or people often refer to it as their special education hours, although it's actually broader than that. And in our offerings, we indicated which of these would apply to those particular categories. And then people know which ones will apply to their own disciplinary work, which is another thing they have to watch for. So we are working with um, the educators to try to help them to see the opportunities that help them with their recertification. Okay, thank you. And if you could, um, my next question, if you could go back to your presentation, and I believe it was the first slide uh, where you were listing the different um, uh, offerings for professional development. I think it must've been the list, yeah, the sample of offerings. I have a question on 
a question and I want to put you on the spot. It's the last bullet, the WIDA standards. And I know that that has to go on to the, uh, an SEL, licensure, sheltered English language. And I know that this has a connection in a previous presentation that Rhoda Webb has made to all the districts and all the school committee, uh, all the school committees on English language learners. Can you just explain to us, and I think people maybe in the audience may have a question, what's the WIDA? What does that stand for? I don't want to put you on the spot. Well, I, I'm wondering if Rhoda is better to answer this than me. I mean, this is related to the English language learners. You're right. And I think the WIDA standards have been updated recently. And so the proposal that was made was to have the opportunity for the um, English language development teachers to have more time to work on the new standards, but Rhoda would probably be the better person to give you the basics of what are the WIDA standards. Is that what you're wanting, Joan, is sort of the Yeah, what? I guess um, just knowing about, I mean, you know, for the general public, they look at that and go, what's a WIDA standard? Is that something yeah. that my child yeah. in the general public would be, general population, is that something I need as a parent? Do I need to know, is this another standard come from the state? But I guess just knowing that it is something that is for the English language learners and those teachers that teach the ESLs, Sheltered English Immersion. That so, is correct. Rhoda, okay. did you want to add anything to that? No, you explained it really well. So the, so the acronym is World Class Instruction Design and Assessment. That's correct. What is it again? World? World Class Instruction Design and Assessment. So it's alphabet soup. We can add that to our acronym and, list. And with it, with those words, you still wouldn't know that it necessarily that it relates to English language learners, but that is yeah. what it you went. Thanks, Rhoda, and yeah. thanks, Dr. Ryan Hort. I just think that and in and, and just knowing this that you know, Rhoda, you had made a presentation before the three districts. And I'm sure you, we've gone over different parts of what is in the SEL, but it's nice to see that the connections that are happening as we go through, even from previous meetings to this, to the professional development, which means that it's in the forefront, it's important, and it's important for everybody to know about and also educate our audience members and the public who will be watching this. Thank you very much to the administration. Dr. Ryan Hort, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sure there were other acronyms in there, so I apologize if there were other ones thrown in. Thank you very much. And it was great to hear um, just about the process of submitting proposals so that teachers um, are able to participate in a workshop that is meaningful to their work as a teacher, uh, depending upon their subject matter or grade level. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Reinhorn, for that update. We really appreciate it. Thank Greg. you for the opportunity. And I just want to uh, thank Dr. Reinhorn and the Professional Development Committee. This work begins early on in the year and takes quite a, a bit of effort and time and thoughtfulness to make sure that people have a great experience on the Professional Development Day. And um, I think Dr. Reinhardt will also agree that Nancy Bissett, um, who is the admin support central office, is a key player in helping us organize all of the moving parts and offerings um, to make the day successful. I hope my big eyes conveyed that I absolutely agree with Greg. There's no getting through this with, without uh, Nancy's key role um, behind the scenes in all steps of the process. So huge thank you to Nancy. We definitely appreciate all of Nancy's work and I'm sure she appreciates the shout out. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, and we're gonna move on to our next order uh, item, I'm sorry, of new business. Um, which brings us to the approval of grants and donations. Um, so we have um, a donation of $1,000 um, that has been donated by Capo Bianco Law to the Northboro School Lunch Program. Um, I know Capo Bianco Law has donated in the past, and so we thank them for their uh, continued support to our lunch program. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's a motion or any comments about this. Kelly. I can make a motion if it's not a literary long one I have to read. <laughs> you go for it. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. 
Um, I'd like to make a motion to accept the donation of $1,000 to the Northboro School Lunch Program from Capo, Capo Bianco Law um, PC. Second. Great, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I just wanna say thank you. Absolutely. What, do we know what, um, what sparked this donation? Is it um, a student rel relative or is this just a donation to the school or do we know any background of it? Greg, I can, I can take it. I remember the origin of it, if that's okay. Um, sure. Originally, originally during, during COVID, there was um, you know, a concern for students that weren't, weren't getting meals and then potentially having you know, negative balances on their accounts because of everything accrued. So uh, the Capo Bianco Law Group reached out and said, how can we help? And we just went through, we wanted to make sure it was a formal donation. And she said, what if we keep going? And I said, well, you know, if you're, we'll if you're willing, <laughs> we will gladly accept the, graciously the donation. Um, and, and, and Becky and I are working on the best ways to, uh, you know, spend and allocate those funds. So it's very much appreciated, as mentioned. And I'll just add that Capo Bianco Law has been a generous a donator to the school system for many, many years. So again, we're very grateful for the donation and thoughtfulness. And um, I think it's going to a, a great cause. Thank you. And thank you for that background information. Very helpful. Any further discussion before our vote? All right, we have a motion and a second to accept the donation. Uh, so we're going to do a roll call vote. We'll start with Ms. Frank. Yes. And Ms. Gannett. Yes. Ms. Tagliaferri. And myself, Lauren Bailey Jones, is a yes. So uh, we have accepted the donation unanimously. Thank you very much to Capo Bianco Law. Uh, so next, we're going to head to old business. So we're going to start with a COVID update from the one and only Mary Ellen Duggan. Um, Greg, do you have anything uh, to add before we- No, just unfortunately, Greg? Mary Ellen has to spend another evening at a school committee meeting talking about COVID-19. But, um, you know, again, she's, she's uh, an amazing uh, leader in our district who's done an amazing job over the past two years. Um, and I think we're heading in the right direction, but I'll, I'll let Mary Ellen um, make that statement. Yes, we can keep hoping, keep your fingers crossed, elbows crossed, legs crossed, everything crossed that we are heading in the right direction. So before I start on the COVID update, I just need to give it, we give a big shout outs here to the town of Northboro employees who have helped us through this all, along with our nurses who you all know are just amazing human beings and have gone above and beyond. And just last week, if you asked every single one of them, they felt like their head was above water for the first time all year. I'm not sure what changed. Our numbers are still high, but something changed and everybody kind of could come up for air. So it's a nice, so it is heading in the right direction, but without our DPW and the Board of Health, um, Kristen Black, without all of Keith's um, facilities teams, we never would have been able to do all of the test and stay programs or anything. So. Um, they have been behind us throwing down ice melt for us at the test and stay sites, getting heaters to be on auto automatic. So they started at five o'clock in the morning to warm up that trailer. So they've all been amazing. So um, kudos to everybody there. Um, so I think the easiest way to see what's happening in COVID is to look at the dashboard that's available for everybody. Um, and I would, oh, Greg, can I have the ability to share my screen, please? Should be all set. All right. All right, can everybody see that? So this is the dashboard that's available for um, public viewing at all times. We have a daily positive case count, which um, is updated daily. Um, if you go to this link, maybe. So the daily case count is updated and in each school building, elementary school building, you can click on the school and see the cases for the week in the classrooms that they've been in. So if we will highlight Z here, since they're here. So if you click on Z, 
each teacher is listed and the number of cases in that classroom for last week is a column and then for every day in the week, the present week here. So this is a way that people will have the ability to see what's going on in their school, in the district, in their school and um, in their classroom, each classroom for people that wanna be in the know. Um, if we go back to the main dashboard, this is last week's dashboard um, updated. We have presently this week, we I think had 52 cases, which is great. So we're still trending down. Never in my life would I ever think <laughs> that I would say 52 cases <laughs> was trending down. Last year, I was looking at the data this afternoon to compare. Last year total in the whole year, we had 310 cases for September to June. Um, in one week this year, we had 246. So to put that in perspective, our highest case count last year was 28 in a week. Um, so this is just amazing that we are heading in this direction and we're all doing okay. So there are a lot of numbers on this board. Um, so you can take that every week, come and take a look at it. So our positive cases, I was tracking this for every four weeks, but I decided to expand it because if we did it four weeks, you wouldn't see what happened really before the surge happened. So we are really trending in the right direction here. And hopefully each the past three weeks we have been cut in half each week. Um, and then our year to date positives are here. Last year, our top line number was 30. So if you looked at last year's numbers, so it is just really totally amazing. Um, the good part is that our vaccination rates are really high too. I've been meeting with the Northboro Board of Health agent. She, they have some grant money and we're trying to, uh, I've been meeting with Rhoda. We're trying to um, promote vaccines across our whole district and town and um, try and find out where our pockets are, where we're not hitting and who's not getting the information that they might need and not able to ac access vaccine. Uh, the Board of Health is willing to do whatever we need to get our students vaccinated. Um, in the most expedient way. So um, we are looking at the numbers because you can see Proctor numbers are a little bit lower than everybody else. So we're trying to look into that and find out why that is. But um, so we are on top of that with the Board of Health uh, working on that public health promotion there. Um, if people wanna find out where to get a Vax Finder, they can click on that link here. And then our screening and testing is still going strong. Our test and stay um, was actually going to end on Friday, but we haven't needed it all week. There's only been a few students who have been in test and stay this week and the nurses have been doing it at the schools. Um, so that's been working out well. But our, um, as you know, beginning on Monday, February 7th, we will no longer be contact tracing and we will be part no longer be doing test and stay, but we will be, doing adding in a weekly at home antigen test on Friday on Thursdays we're asking people to do it on Thursday so participating in the pooled screening on Mondays and an at home antigen test on Thursdays those test kits will go home the beginning of the week we just got the delivery today so um, I would encourage everybody to opt in to the at home testing you will get a test kit with two tests in it every other week to be used weekly for, for uh, antigen testing on Thursdays. So um, our testing is still going strong. Our pooled screening has dropped off a little bit since after Christmas. I'm not sure if it's because of the numbers of positives we've had, but um, we're still hovering right around the 1700 to 1800 mark. And then um, the state data is there that's available on the state side. There's all kinds of links. That, um, that will answer your question, testing links for pool testing, for the at-home antigen testing, information on all of them, and then vaccine links. So there's a lot of information, anything that you could wanna know about what's going on in the district regarding um, COVID-19 is right on the dashboard on the district website. So I am happy to answer any questions anybody might have. Thank you so much, Mary Ellen. Kelly has a question, so I'll start off with you, Kelly. Thank you. Um, two questions. Um, one um, about 
distancing. Um, are we keeping the six foot lunch? And are you for the elementary? And I don't even know if you have them in the middle schools and the high schools, if it's six feet or not. And um, if you are doing that, how long do you anticipate that going for? And then my second question is about masks. So six feet distance at lunch, I don't, every elementary school in North Broward is at six feet for lunch. Um, I don't anticipate us changing that okay. anytime soon. I think when we think about our mitigation, we, I know you've all seen that presentation with the Swiss cheese model, right? So we're removing one layer of that Swiss cheese with our contact tracing. I mean, we're adding in another layer with an additional testing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so we need to think about that, what we're doing. I think we would not remove the distancing right now because it's just an extra layer to keep us at lower risk. Great. Um, and then um, mask mandates. Um, we're keeping that um, in for our kids and stuff. Is there, I know some districts that are hitting the percentages of vaccines, they're dropping the masks. And so I just wanted to check in with how you and the, the MAT team feel about the masks and stuff. So we have our masking policy, which mm -hmm. is in, yep. in place right now. So um, in the, it would be K to eight, it has to be a district wide to apply for the um, okay. attestation that you're at the 80% to not be, not have the mandate apply. So the DESI mandate for masking is going through the end of February right now. Um, and then it will be reevaluated. I think for, so for right now, we will have masking until the end of February when that mandate is in place. And then I think we would look at the data then and see what's happening, depending on what that mandate is. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Mary Ellen? Erin. Just a quick question on some other restrictions that we had kind of put in place, I think through this surge, and I know we're just starting to see the drop, but you know, as far as indoor recess, have we talked about sort of lifting some of those restrictions? I know indoor recess, the kids had to sit at their desks and couldn't even play a board game with a friend. And there was no class to class um, buddies, you know, sometimes like the fifth graders read with the second graders, like all of that stuff stopped. Is there talk about at least lifting some of those things now that we're starting to see a pretty big drop of and I don't know, maybe that wasn't even the district, maybe that was just Peasley, but I know that's been, the kids are getting frustrated and parents are, you know, like feeling like, okay, I think we're getting to a place where the kids can play a board game masked together again. And, and how risky is that right now? And so just wondering where that stands. So I think we look, the, the mat meets every Tuesday, as you know, and we look at all the data that, that's in the district and the town and what's happening. Um, so we did discuss yesterday, what through the surge, we had instituted like no group work, yeah. um, the desks spaced as much as feasible, but three feet in rows as a default for all the desks in the classrooms, if it was feasible. So that was just because during the surge, we needed to do whatever we could to lower everybody's risk. So we did discuss yesterday, um, lifting, the group work limitations that we've put in place um, as we see the numbers fall, you know, they're cut in half each week for the past two weeks. So that's wonderful news. So there will be things that are lifted and we have to remember, you know, like as we're lifting some, we need to make sure that when we can, you know, that everybody's wearing their mask with fidelity that I have to say the most important thing, well, there's three, right? So vaccine, masking, but staying home if you're sick is like, I have to say that's like one of the things I can't, we can't stress enough because that's where we're seeing any kind of transmission happening is, you know, when people are coming to school sick, um, coming to school with symptoms, it's just a cold, it's just my allergies, but we really need to stay home with symptoms and call your school, school nurse and they'd be able to advise you as to what to do. And I mean, Desi did say that, you know, with People have the at-home test kit. When you call the nurse and say you're symptomatic, they might tell you to use your test kit, not on Thursday, but on the Tuesday if you have symptoms. So 
I think we need to think about that, that um, we have the opportunity to get test kits, antigen test kits into people's hands. So I don't know why people wouldn't just take that opportunity. So I would highly encourage people to do that. I will say, Mary Ellen, I don't know, have you had a lot of enrollments in the, in that? Not I as many know, as I expected. Yeah, I think it really got lost in, in Greg's email. I know the PTOs, we like sent out a thing to post it to our Facebook pages with the enrollment form. Um, a lot of people who read Greg's email even said they kind of missed it. So that may just be something, whether we send it out in just a completely separate email or I don't know. I know a lot of people felt like it was it was hard to realize that it was like a new thing and a new enrollment. And so there was a lot of um, confusion about that. But the, I know, I think all four PTOs ended up posting to their Facebook page and trying to promote it that way as well. Um, to yeah, get so however you can get the message out there, we'd appreciate it. We did ask. Um, each of the principals to put it out and send it in their weekly newsletters that they send home to families too, just as a little, a little blurb and not the whole, you know, with the link to the whole email that Greg had with all the information on it. So hopefully we'll get more people. It's a rolling admission. It's not, um, it doesn't just stop at a certain time. People can sign it on to the program at any time. I think, Mary Ellen, I think we can also simplify the message and, um, and have principals send it out as well in a simplified form. I think that would help, but um, that is good feedback. So thank you, Aaron. And I'll just make a comment that, you know, our plan is to um, lessen some of the restrictions, obviously coming back from December break, we were um, more restrictive just so that we remained in school. And I think um, on, we will be sharing with teachers tomorrow that starting on Monday, they can return to some of their normal um, routines um, with the caveat that they, we still need to, you know, be mindful of, of social distancing and contact tracing and all those other things. But um, we are moving in the right direction. And that announcement will go out to teachers tomorrow um, when Mary Ellen and I have time to connect. <laughs> so, yeah, so the contact tracing. Um, is done at the nurse's discretion. So if there's a cluster of cases in a classroom or in a group or a sports team or whatever, we would contact trace and follow up with that that specific group of people. But it's not gonna be, it's not contact tracing as we know it now. Thank you. Um, and, and one thing I guess that um, I've thought about as well is um, vocabulary and how, um, you know, there's a lot of sort of different phrases meaning the same thing. Um, I feel like sort of the, um, sometimes we say antigen test, um, and some people use the term just rapid test. And so, and then there's the pooled screening. And so if people aren't used to that verbiage um, and the different types of um, tests there are, there may be some confusion. So maybe uh, in future communication, spelling it out a little bit more <laughs> or using all of the verbiage <laughs> would be helpful as well. Um, so we're going to move to Kelly and then Joan. Kelly. Um, thanks. Mary Ellen, question about um, your opinion. Hypothetical situation. A child has post-nasal drip, you know, so they've got the sore nose thing in the morning. They take a rapid test at home and it's negative. Would you advise that child to still stay home because they have a symptom? Or if they're vaccinated and they wear a mask, would you send the child? An at-home test that was negative yeah, with symptoms, like a, yeah, I would advise you to get a new. PCR. So go for a PCR after it. Okay. So an at-home test that's negative. So at-home tests for symptomatic people, we accept a positive result, right? So if yep. we walk like a duck, it is a duck, right? Yep. You have symptoms, yep. you have positive antigen test. But a negative test, we would recommend that you get a PCR. And the other option is to follow it up consecutively a couple of days with the mm -hmm. antigen test. So we we really, in this area, getting a PCR is not difficult to do at this yeah. point in time. I mean, the lines aren't crazy long like they were. You know, we have uh, the New England Sports Center where you can go without an appointment. Yeah. We have the Ashland Commuter Rail Station where you can make an appointment, but you can get in a same day appointment right now. Um, at their project beacon also. So in those sites are still gonna be open at least through March. 
-hmm. that I know of. So I think that to get a PCR isn't hard. And we do a PCR test every Monday at school, yeah. right? So yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Joan. Uh, thanks, Lauren. Um, thank you so much, Mary Ellen, for everything that you're doing and your whole medical staff and the nurses that, you know, we hear in the news how the nurses in hospitals are, uh, you know, just so exhausted and everything. And I'm sure that's also with your staff and just hearing like during the snow, what, you know, Keith and his staff did to make sure that, you know, it was available after the snowstorm and it was in the safe conditions by putting that salt down. Um, my question to you is going back to, seems like a long time and it is August, 2020, when we talked about the phasing in of the reopening of schools, two things that you said we were gonna institute and I want to know if they're still in or if the updates have changed. And that was that each building was going to have a separate nurses station or room that if a child had tested, had symptoms for COVID, they would not go to the nurses room, they go to another room uh, where the parents would pick them up within a, a period of time. So are those rooms still in place? And is it still that the parents have, um, you know, a, a period of time where they have to, somebody or a guardian have to come in and pick up the child who may be suspected of having COVID? So those rooms are not, um, in all the buildings, they are not. We had um, medical waiting rooms in um, all our buildings. So some of them we were using conference rooms, some of them we were using um, alternate spaces. So they are not being used right now. They are not there. But like at Malikin has a separate room in their her nurse's office that, that that was their medical waiting room. So it's still there. So they do have that space. but. Um, right now, we do not, you know, we know, we know so much more now, right? So we've learned um, through this pandemic and the person is just kept in the nurse's office masked. If they, if there is a different space, like a conference room beside the nurse's office that they can wait in if there's other things happening in the nurse's room, you know, we just do work with what we have. And what about the, um, do the parents still have a certain time? limit that they have to come and pick up the student that may be suspected of having COVID? I think we could always encourage a time limit. It wasn't like a, we weren't going to throw them out in the street if they didn't get there in time. But uh, I didn't think, you know, <laughs> you know, like we just wanted to encourage, we wanted the people to know, like, waiting to your child can't wait at school for two hours when we think they have COVID. But now, you know, like thinking of someone having COVID now in school, is totally different than thinking of someone having COVID last year when they were in school, you know? So we've learned so much um, through all of this and we know what keeps people safe, right? We know all the mitigation to keep us safe. So um, we still encourage parents, you know, there needs to be a reasonable amount of time if we're called, you're called that your child is sick and you need to come to school in a reasonable amount of time or find someone else that can come pick them up. Well, we're in a much better shape. As you said, we know a lot more and that's because of your time, dedication and Dylan's diligence and your MAT uh, staff. So thank everybody for what you're doing. It's a tireless, but it's definitely appreciated by everybody in the communities. Thank you very much. And Joan, one thing worth noting just as far as the collaboration is, is if Mary Ellen ever needed a medical room, if we did have the need <laughs> for it, everyone knows where the HEPA filters, you know, the additional uh, negative air machines are. We have them on standby. And if she told me we needed to happen. We could make it happen within 15 minutes. So it's still available. It's just not, you know, restricted area now where it was up until the end of last year, but it is possible if needed. It's one of the layers of mitigation we have available to us. Thank you. And thanks for the collaboration cooperation between the administrative staff and the schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Um, it's great to hear also the report about the nurses finally feeling like they could sort of keep their head above water. Um, and I hope that that feeling continues, especially as we lift uh, some of our mitigation with the contact tracing. Um, so hopefully uh, better times to come. <laughs> yeah, you, you never hear this come from a nurse that they're looking forward to doing their screenings, regular, regular everyday <laughs> school nurse thing. So that's, it's good news. Thank you very much. We all appreciate it very much.
Um, next on our agenda, we're going to switch gears a little bit as we um, head to another um, item of old business, which is an update for our Coalition for Equity. So Rhoda Webb, our um, Director of English Learners and Equity, um, as well as Greg Martineau, um, uh, run this committee. And so I'm not sure who we're hearing from today, but I saw Rhoda on mute. So I think it's probably <laughs> going to be Rhoda. So Rhoda, we uh, would love to hear an update about the coalition. Yes. And of course, there's several of us here tonight that are on the coalition. So, um, so please feel free to add. So the coalition has started up again this year, and it is composed of students, teachers, school committee members, administrators, and community members. Um, and so there are 28 members this year, and included in that number are five students from Algonquin. So we've had three meetings this year um, for the full coalition, and then in between, uh, there are four working groups uh, who have been meeting, um, as I said, in between meetings. So the four groups uh, this year is the Acts of Kindness group. And the purpose is to build a sense of community in which everyone feels that they belong. And the group, um, of course, has reached out and is supporting the work that the towns are doing next week, but they're also brainstorming um, more ideas uh, to do for the, during this year. The second group, uh, Mary Ellen Remillard is in the Acts of Kindness group. The second group, Equity Resources Group. Um, the purpose is to develop a website that provides collections of resources to the community. And each collection would be a, for a particular age range and focused on a topic or with a variety of types of media. Um, and so this is being uh, thought through right now um, of how what it's gonna look like and what to include. Um, the third group, and Stephanie is uh, leading this group, the third group is the keynote speakers group, um, and the purpose is to curate conversations um, led by a keynote that would be um, stimulating and locally relevant, and it would lead to further conversations in the home for all family members and result in actions that make a marked difference in the experience of students and residents. And at this time, the working group is looking at various speakers um, in order to choose one or more um, to address our community. So that is a work in progress. And Greg is in that, uh, the speakers working group. And the fourth group is learning music through cultures. And the purpose of this group is to promote and learn about music from different cultural groups in our communities. And at this point, uh, we are gathering um, very good information on music groups uh, that are local. Uh, and we're gonna be deciding whether to have small events or a larger one in the spring. Um, so that is where we are at right now. There's a lot of work and a lot of good conversations happening within the groups. And so we'll have more information um, as time goes on. Thank you, Rhoda, for that update. I'm going to see if anyone has any questions or comments. Joan, we'll start with you. I'm sorry, um, I didn't lower it down from the last discussion, but uh, Rhoda, thank you very much for this um, good report that you have. I like to see these four groups, and I think definitely through the music, especially for the younger children, that's how they learn about the different cultures, and, you know, through music, through dance, and just studying rhythms and beats, whatever it is. And it, when you do do the keynote speakers, is that something that would be available to a larger audience during this uh, pandemic with, with adequate spacing? Yes, I think Greg can address that. Yeah, so I think that the plan is to open it up to, you know, the, the school communities, but also the larger um, communities of North Rome, South Rome. And most likely it would be held at Algonquin Regional High School in the auditorium. And then we possibly could we also have, we could also have that taped to be played back through the cable at, at, at various times, correct? Yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Rhoda, thank you very much. And the administration and Greg, thank you. You're welcome. So um, through the chair, I just would add that the other, um, moving component to our work around um, the coalition is last year, the coalition 
did some work around helping the district launch a equity audit. So as the committee knows, Mass Insight is completing an equity audit this year. Um, and we plan on having Mass Insight present um, its findings at the March combined meeting. So that is work that is moving forward as well. Um, Rhoda, Stephanie, and I um, had a preliminary meeting um, a few weeks ago to hear some initial findings um, before Mass Insight begins its recommendation phase. Um, and we were all very impressed and excited um, to hear the outcomes of the report and learn more about their findings. Greg, will um, the findings also be um, presented to members of the coalition? You're muted, Greg. So we're working with Mass Insight on exactly the information flow. So um, I think first they'll present um, findings to the district leadership team and then um, the coalition and then to the committee. And we haven't worked out exactly what that would look like, but that is um, some of our preliminary thinking. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Rhoda? All right, Rhoda, thank you so much for the update. It's great to hear what all the subcommittees are working on. Um, we are gonna move to, let's see, we are at the superintendent's report to the committee. So I'm gonna turn it over to Superintendent Martineau to walk us through um, that agenda item. Sure, so I'll begin with enrollment. So I'm pleased to share that class sizes are within the class size policy, I-240. And on January 26, uh, North Borough's enrollment total was 1,539 students, no change from last month, um, 14 students less than what NESDEC had projected. Um, and NESDEC is projecting for the upcoming academic year, a student enrollment of 1,566 in the North Borough principals um, and the leadership team is working uh, really closely on monitoring enrollment uh, monitoring kindergarten enrollment and making sure that our class sizes are within the school committee's class size policy. And at this point in time, we are uh, comfortable, um, but again, we'll monitor the class sizes over the next several months. Also in your packet is the FY22 monthly general, general fund expenditure report, and I'll turn it over to Rebecca Pellegrino, Director of Finance, to provide her monthly update. Good evening, everyone. Um, so as of January 31st, 2022, we had $170,779 remaining on the bottom line, or 0.66% of the um, FY22 budget. In comparison to, the la to last year at the same time, we had $342,281, or 1.36% remaining. As I mentioned last month, our areas of watch really are our teacher and our nurse substitutes. I've also been working very closely with Marie Allen and the student support services team to review any unanticipated expenses and also to identify any savings um, or alternate funding sources. Um, in addition to working with Marie, my team and I have really been digging into the Northborough budget over the, the past two weeks or so. Um, to identify any savings and expenses that may be moved again to alternate um, funding sources such as grants. Um, while the amount remaining on the bottom line is lower than we've re seen recently, I do think that all anticipated expenses have been encumbered for the fiscal year. And at this time, I do welcome any questions. Any questions for Becky? Yes, Joan. Um, I don't have a question, but I have a motion to accept the report and to audit it. If I could make that. Absolutely. Um, I move that we uh, accept and to audit the FY22 uh, monthly general fund expenditure report as, a, as of January 31st, 2022. Thank you. Do we have a second? All right, I'll second. Lauren Bailey Jones. Any any uh, further discussion? 
All right, so we have a motion and a second to accept until audited um, our monthly fund expenditure report. So this will be a roll call vote. Ms. Frank? Yes. Ms. Gannett? Yes. Ms. Tagliaferri? Yes. And myself, Lauren Bailey Jones, is yes. So it is approved unanimously. Becky, thank you so much for that update. Um, so that will bring us to the capital plan. So in your packet is the FY23 through FY29 capital plan and we did touch upon the um, significant, significant project that will be moved forward next year. Um, and that is the Proctor roof. Also in your packet are the budget goals and budget calendar. And um, again, those will be um, outlined in more detail in the FY23 recommended budget presentation. So um, after last month's meeting and presenting the FY23 recommended budget to the school committee, I made a recommendation for the committee to not vote the recommended budget at that time. Typically the committee does vote the budget in um, January, but given the fact that we did have some additional time um, that allowed the leadership team and principals and I to um, kind of revisit the budget to make sure that it included all of the aspects of uh, programming that we thought were important to include in the budget. Um, and this evening I'll review um, our final recommendation um, and hopefully a vote of approval from the school committee. So I am going to share my screen. And if Google is listening, I think they should make a design change. I think they should move their share button and slideshow button in two separate locations because I always want to hit share when I present, but I won't do that tonight. I agree. <laughs> so, so for this evening, I will not um, go through the entire presentation, but I'll um, speak to some of the highlights of the FY23 budget and then happily answer any questions from the committee. Um, so as presented last month, we did talk about the mission and vision that drives our work. It's really about um, the student experience and making sure that the financial aspect of our operation really helps us move our work forward. Um, we talked about the budget process, that the budget process really begins early on in the academic year um, and moves through the months of September, October, November, and really, um, um, is finished with an annual town meeting and hopefully a town meeting approval. Um, in terms of the, the budget variables, um, these variables continue to be true. Um, Chapter 70 funding and Student Opportunity Act funding. So some of the legislative advocacy that's happening behind the scene really center around Chapter 70 funding. Um, and specifically around making sure that the funding is keeping up with inflation. The Chapter 70 funding currently is being um, funded at a 4.50% um, annual inflation rate. And there is some advocacy and legislation around making sure it is kept up with um, inflation at a 5.9%. So we're monitoring that closely. Um, out of district special education funding, there's also some legislation around um, speeding up the Student Opportunity Act funding, specifically around um, special education out of district transportation reimbursement. And then lastly, we and I think we can't um, speak about this enough, we are being impacted by inflation. Um, and we do anticipate this to be a factor as we look um, to next year's budget. And um, Becky, I think you give an example around paper, um, just the cost of a carton of paper has increased um, by 60% in um, the past six months, which is significant. So in terms of the, the overall budget and the, um, the work that we do in, in terms of grounding our, our request, um, those requests are grounded in the school committee's approved budget goals, but also um, um, the district strategic plan. Um, and again, we try to ensure that the dollars asked for really help us move the school committee's budget goals and the strategic objectives forward. So in terms of where we are um, with the budget process, so in January, um, 
we presented a recommended budget of $26,692,953, uh, which represented a 3.46% increase. And at this point this evening, we are, um, we are not recommending any change to that recommended budget that we presented in January. So in terms of, you know, what are the, the FY23 increases? So um, there are several categories. Um, one is some increased um, costs in contracted custodial cleaning services and tra trash removal contracts, um, technology infrastructure maintenance and, maintenance and support, um, collaborative tuitions, and most of the increases really have to do with salary increases in COLAs. And again, we are um, a people organization. So much of our work is around um, hiring the people to really support the work and um, growth of our students. In terms of budget offsets, so again, last month we presented our budget offsets. So really two categories, um, FY22 circuit breaker special education reimbursement offset, which is a little under 1.2 million and then FY22 circuit breaker special education transportation reimbursement offset. Again, this was as a result of the Student Opportunity Act, and that was um, a little over um, $33,000. So in terms of the fiscal year recommended budget, um, we are recommending a budget of dollars um, which is an increase over fiscal year 22 of $893,275, which represents a 3.46% increase. For the most part, this is a level services budget um, with a few growth areas. And I just want to point out um, to the committee and the community that uh, we do have a high level of service that we're providing our students. And then much of our work centers around how do we uh, maximize the expertise in the resources that we do have, um, again, to uh, provide students with an outstanding experience in the classroom. Um, but the budget does include some growth areas, and I'll just go over the growth areas um, quickly. So um, through the budget process, we did talk about the need to add another um, specialized classroom, a castle classroom. And this is a shared expense with our South Grove School District. Um, I do know the superintendent well, so we have a nice partnership. Um, the CASEL program includes a 0.5 teacher for Northborough and a 0.5 teacher for Southborough. And then Northborough, we have three uh, support uh, professionals to support that programming. The FY23 budget also includes funding for instructional technology specialists. Um, that instructional technology specialists will be shared between the elementary schools. The budget also includes a team chairperson. So as we discussed in the budget process, we currently have a 1.0 team chairperson who supports four elementary schools and um, we will be adding another uh, team chairperson. So that will give us increased capacity. And again, the team chairperson really is key in terms of providing special education teachers with um, support um, allows them to focus on instructing students and less time around um, running meetings, facilitating meetings, and the bureaucracy and paperwork that's required of special education. And lastly, um, the total positions for um, the uh, recommended budget is 5.5, I believe, is the total. So um, again, for the most part, we have a high level of service for our, our, um, our programs for our students. And we believe that um, by adding these positions, we'll be supporting our students and our educators um, in, a, in an impactful way. So at this point in time, I will stop sharing my screen and be happy to answer any questions uh, from the committee. Thank you for the presentation, Greg. We'll start with Kelly. Thank you. Um, so 3.46% is what we talked about before, and that didn't include the, the, the FTEs that we just, that you just said are gonna be included. 
So was there anything that was majorly taken away to be able to include those? Or was it no. just like we working and I see Becky shaking her head. Yeah. No, and I think as, as the finance team, um, as we, we get closer uh, to the month of January, and as we move into February and March, we have better data. Um, so I think it's really around Becky and the finance team having better data to make more informed decisions. So nothing was removed from the original requests. Um, however, we did get better data around some of the, the line items that allowed us to um, fund those positions in this budget. Okay. And um, did the retirements all come in? Was there any surprises for? Yes, there were surprises. That, that, oh. <laughs> um, a couple. Um, but for the most part, we knew most of the um, retirees as of January 15th. But there were a couple that we um, were not expecting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Joan? Joan, you're muted. Thank you. I saw Aaron was before me oh. when I raised my hand. So she can sure. go first. Sorry, I must oh, have. It's okay. You can go, Joan. Um, what I would like to say is that I think this budget season has been a very open and allowed a lot of good dialogue. I would like to commend uh, Lauren as chair to um, have open meetings where all members could attend and it was a posted school committee meeting for the operational budget, which allowed us to have some really good dialogue and to look at the numbers and to be really informed. So along with thanking Lauren, I'd also like to thank Greg and Rebecca for the great job in doing this. Uh, there was a lot of work to get to a 3.46. And I know there might've been some other things that, you know, that we had that we may like to have on this in this budget that are not in it, but hopefully that we can keep those to the forefront and put them into the budget uh, season looking into it next year, which well, as soon as you finish this one, it seems like you're on to the next one. So I'd like to thank all the people involved in the good dialogue going forward. And I will defer to Erin, but I would like to make a motion to accept this unless Erin had one that she was planning on giving. Perfect. Thank you, Joan. We'll come back to you. But uh, first, we will go to Erin. No, Greg, I just, I guess I have a little bit of hesitation with this, with this budget. And I hope you can ease some of that hesitation. I think, you know, we brought it up last time that we were concerned that it was a little too restrictive and that it can only go lower and not higher. And is there, are we setting ourselves up for you know, we just talked about paper and I laughed because, you know, the cost of running a business and that's what this is, is becoming more expensive and the cost of paper has gone up and the cost of toner has gone up and the PTO at Peasley is buying paper and toner, which is great. But, you know, I was at Peasley the other day and there were parents dropping off paper because they heard that the schools can't buy paper. And I just want to make sure that we're not putting ourselves in a position that we have no wiggle room. And, you know, our budget is already so tight right now. And are we going to be able to, I mean, this is such a small thing, but everything is costing more money these days. And sure. no, I think it's a great, that, you know, a great, the PTO is buy paper for, for elementary schools on end and parents uh, parents shouldn't have to donate things like paper. No, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll just also be clear that the paper and some of the shortages that we have are supply chain issues, not financial issues. So it's not that we don't have the money to buy paper, it's that the supply chain really isn't allowing us to. And that's the same with, with um, our the toner. So I think, Becky, there was a, a fire um, with the Conica Minolta plant, which really impacted our toner supply chain. So there are rational reasons why teachers don't have paper, and it's not because there's a lack of funding. Um, we, are, we are taking into consideration inflation as we look at this FY23 budget. Um, and I'll, I'll also add that, you know, one thing I did not share this evening is, and we do have SR3 funding, and we do have a plan. Um, and that is an additional $300,000 um, over the next two years 
that will support some of the uh, budgetary items. Um, I feel very comfortable with this budget. I think 3.46 is, is um, again, a budget that allows us to move forward programming, support the supplies and materials, keep our class sizes low, maintains our, our teacher body, uh, our teaching staff. Um, and, I, and honestly, I'm very comfortable with this budget. If I wasn't, um, I definitely, we'd probably be having a different conversation at this point in time. And Becky, I'm not sure if there's anything you would like to add. No, I mean, we've really been looking at all aspects of like down to our heating and our utilities and, and just really and doing a comparison over the past few years because we have seen some changes, but I do feel, um, I feel like the work that we've done, you know, in the finance office and then also with the administration, um, I, I do think that this is a budget that um, will support um, the needs of the schools. Okay. And, now and I'm dreaming about copy paper right now. <laughs> I was loading my card at BJ's the other day. <laughs> um, and now when you talk about classroom sizes, I guess I'm such a huge fan of small classroom sizes and I will always fight for that. And our classroom sizes make me a little bit nervous right now. I feel like we are barely maintaining our classroom size policy. And, you know, I looked at through the numbers today and, you know, we're at 30% of our classrooms are over our, you know, what our target is. We have about 30% that are like within a student. And I just feel like this is not the time to be pushing our classroom sizes to the max. You know, I, I look at our grades and I look at our kids and you know, next year, our third graders are going to never have had a normal school year. That, that's like astonishing to me. You know, third graders have not had one full normal year. And when you look at our second grade class right now, you know, three of the schools are maxed out. And I know a lot can happen between now and September, but, you know, that is a red flag to me like oh my we need some third grade teachers next year because those classrooms are maxed out at three of our four schools and those kids are you know are struggling i mean they truly haven't had a normal year and we are like packing those classrooms that makes me nervous and the teachers can probably speak better than i can I just, I have a kid in first grade at Peasley with a very small class size, and I just see the benefits of that. And I don't know, maybe you can shed some light on that or, or how, yeah, how I mean, do we I, handle if we do need some extra teacher, you know, yeah, so, where are we going to come from? So I think that the principals and I are having, and, you know, the leadership team, we're having conversations around class sizes and making sure that you know, we're projecting forward where the bubbles are and where we need to pay close attention to. Um, so that is, those are conversations that we're having and there's some shifting of, you know, there's there's a lot happening behind the scenes that, that um, a lot of moving parts that we're having conversations about internally. And again, our internal planning, I'm very comfortable with, with where class sizes will be. Um, I also will share that I don't think it's, I think, yes, I think um, it would be nice to have classes of 12, um, but our even our class size policy of 18 to 22 um, in grades three, four, five is still very healthy. Um, and I wouldn't, you know, I think it's important to note. Um, and again, I think, you know, the planning that we're doing, I'm comfortable with, with moving forward. I think also, I'll just note that some of the work that we're doing around long-term planning, I know it doesn't help the here and now for students around, you know, looking potentially at um, reconfiguration. Um, right now, if you have, you know, one over and you add another, you can't add another teacher and every time that happens across our district, it just would be um, not fis fiscally sound or sustainable. Um, so Aaron, I guess in short, <laughs> You know, we are monitoring it very closely. I okay. think you've had first-hand experience where we we see there's a bubble, 
will re react accordingly and make sure that it's addressed so that students have a great experience at that grade and that level. worked out so well yeah. like that that third first grade teacher at Peasley was just so appreciative and it, and it's yeah. it's and so it was needed it was needed. so needed and yeah. I just see like where else could that be needed and are we you know are we going to be able to fund those needs if it comes you know I feel like we've always maintained such a high you know, Northboro's always been so known for our, our great schools and our small classroom sizes, and that's what draws people to this town. And it's certainly not our, you know, charming downtown that people move here for. Like, they come here for the schools, and I don't want to lose sight of that. Like, I don't want that to get to get lost. <clears throat> so. Thank you for your feedback, Erin. I keep working um, on the paper, Becky. <laughs> I fought out <laughs> And as a comment, as a teacher myself, uh, my school district is experiencing the same supply chain issues. Uh, we just found out yesterday we are down to one copier in the entire building, and it's in the main office where the principal sits. So um, we uh, are not making any copies. <laughs> so it is, uh, it is probably nationwide. There was a fire at the plant in, I think, Japan. I think it's worldwide, um, actually. Yeah. But Lauren, I will, I will um, you know, I think Aaron, you bring up a great point around communication. You know, parents are thinking they're buying paper because we just have no money. That sets, that's a very different message than we're, there's a supply chain issue. We just can't get the paper that we need. Um, and I think that's important to make sure that the community knows it's not because, again, it's a funding issue at, at the district level. It's a supply chain issue. And I think it's a place, uh, oh, sorry. No, we, sorry. Have placed a, we have placed a truckload order um, for, for the entire district. The problem is we did it in collaboration with seven other districts so that we could go out to bid together and, and find the best pricing. Um, but what's gonna happen is when the company receives a truckload, they're going to um, disperse it amongst the districts. Um, so we won't get it all at once. So we will be continuing to get it piecemeal, but at least th there's some hope on the horizon that we do have a plan in place for paper. It's and one, the school's been great about sharing. <laughs> one sheet at a time, right, Becky? I think they yeah. said. <laughs> but I think the other confusion that's also out there is, you know, Yes, there is a supply issue, but like I was able to go out and buy five huge boxes of paper. So like, why can't the district go, you know, that there's rules and places to the distributors of where we buy that. And um, I think that's also confusing to, to the community and to parents that, you know, I can go to BJ's and buy paper. So why is the district not just running over there to buy paper? Procurement is fun. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Greg, I see you talking, but. Yeah, Amy, I'm not sure if there's anything you want to add just around the conversations that we're having as a leadership team around class size and the moving parts. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, we, we, we are at a comfortable place between that 18 and 22. There are, there are several schools that stay, you know, just under that number. Um, and I think we are doing a really good job when we do get back into those small groups of creating those small uh, work environments across classrooms um, with our specialists, um, using our child study teams to really look at those kids that might be struggling and have had difficulty over the past couple of years. So, um, you know, we look at that all the time. Our new data meetings through our PLCs are really having those conversations. So we're really utilizing the resources and also our district resources in terms of our uh, math coordinator, uh, Mary Coakley, Kathy Lazat, um, uh, Megan Kelty. So we have some really great resources to help us look at what we have and, and how to really reach those students. And now with our EPI, uh, the uh, tutoring and the effort grant, um, you know, I think we're really making good strides and making sure that we're, we're staying on point with what's happening um, with our students. And Amy, I think you can, you can um, share your firsthand experience that the leadership team is meeting talking, you know, with your principal colleagues and Stephanie, Becky, Keith, and Rhoda and the team to really uh, continue to monitor class sizes moving. Into yeah, absolutely. Year. Absolutely. I mean, we, we spent, met this morning. We spent um, two hours. You know, on enrollment. Um, absolutely. So keeping an eye on it and talking about those bubbles that are shifting um, and making sure that we have the appropriate staff to fill those needs. 
Excellent. Thank you so much, Amy, for sharing and for Erin for bringing up um, this conversation. Um, good conversation to have. Um, Joan, I do see your hand up. I just had something that I wanted to add. Um, so uh, one thing that I have been um, an advocate for um, for quite a while is music in our schools. Um, and so I know that that is a budget goal to look into the possibility of um, having a strings program in our North Bro um, schools. So um, although this year um, it was not realized in the budget, at least the recommended budget, um, I do uh, think that it's something that we need to keep on the forefront. Um, uh, our conversation, I believe, perhaps last meeting um, revolved around um, the school configuration study group and sort of um, the recommendations to come from that group in a few months. Um, so I'm hopeful that um, conversations within that group will um, set us up for success, um, hopefully for next, next fiscal year um, uh, for uh, the implementation of a strengths program. Um, so I just wanted to get that out there because I am a huge proponent of um, music in our schools. And I, and I believe one of our music teachers is actually listening in right now. So thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, with that being said, I'm gonna pass it on to Joan. Okay, so I would like to make a motion concerning the operational budget for FY23, if that is okay, Lauren. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I'll take it slow, a little bit long here. Um, I move to approve uh, the Superintendent Martineau's FY 2023 recommended operational budget for the Northborough K-8 schools in the amount of $26,692,998. Which represents an increase of eight hundred and ninety three dollars, eight hundred ninety eight hundred ninety three thousand two hundred seventy five dollars uh, from over the FY twenty two operational budget, which represents a budget increase of three point four six percent, and represents a level services budget. Thank you, Joan. Okay. That was a long, that was a long motion. Do yeah. I hear a second? All second. Right. I will second. second. Oh, Sorry, thanks. I was like nodding, like, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. So we have a motion and a second to accept the recommended budget as presented tonight, um, according to Joan's uh, motion. Any further discussion? All right, we will take a roll call vote. Ms. Frank? Yes. Ms. Gannett? Yes. Ms. Tagliaferri? Yes. Ms. Bailey Jones is a yes. So the budget has passed unanimously. Um, so according to our budget calendar, um, I believe that the next step is to meet with the appropriations committee. Is that correct, Greg? That is, and we have not received the date, but I do expect um, information about that meeting in the next few weeks. Do you think okay. it'll be virtual, Greg? Or do you think I would imagine be, yes. Yeah. Okay. And they're usually on a Saturday, I think, right? Yeah, I think last year was the first year it was, it a, was. In, an evening. So yeah. um, I've not had conversations with John Kader, um, but I will keep people posted. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So at this time, we're going to move on to uh, school committee member reports. So does any school committee member have anything that they'd like to share from any subcommittees um, that they are a part of. Kelly. Thank you. Um, I have three committees or groups that I could report on. Um, the school um, configuration, um, we had our meeting on Thursday, uh, let me see. We had it on Thursday, January um, 13th. And at that meeting, um, the four subcommittee groups, they all broke off into their subcommittee groups. They were um, defined and they broke off to the subcommittee meetings and worked on their agendas and um, formulated their plans. Um, uh, since then, my subcommittee group, we met again and we're all reconvening 
on Thursday, February 10th to, I think, report back to Greg and everybody and kind of report where we're at. Um, I know Keith was going to check in with Greg to see how formal of presentations we need to be doing and stuff for that. But um, so we're going to be reconvening. So then hopefully next month, maybe we'll have a little more of an update on that. Um, for solar meeting, um, that's scheduled for um, Tuesday, February 15th. And then the NSPAC, um, the same two things that I reported last month, um, they're co-hosting um, Sarah Ward with the five other CSPACs um, on Monday, March 28th on executive functioning from 7 to 9 p.m. And then the one that is happening this month in a few weeks is on Friday, February 18th. Um, Jennifer Lipton O'Connor will be hosting an SEL presentation at 9 a.m. And you can go to their website to register for that. And you could also check out their Facebook pages. And both of the flyers have been sent out to all the schools um, to go home with their backpacks or for their digital um, weekly notices and stuff like that. So, um, so that was my three things, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Kelly. And Joan. Uh, thank you, Lauren. I don't have any reports from any of the subcommittees I serve on, but I just have two quick comments. Absolutely. And um, I just wanted to commend um, Superintendent Martineau on his superintendent's report uh, that he does to the parents in the public schools in North Road and South Road. And this one was from January 20, sorry about that guys, 28th, 2022. I love the picture on the front because it looked like it was a read aloud for the um, D Wizard of Oz. And I'm sure in the future, in about 10, probably 10 or less years, these kids will be in the drama club that at Algonquin. And Greg, I'm just so impressed by this report that you put through. And I just know that communication, you know, we always say that is one of our highest things we should try to achieve to, is that I wanted to know, because there's, there's a wealth of knowledge in here, even about the kindness week. I want to know, is do we send a copy of it to the senior citizens in both towns? Or could we, if not, could we send a link to them? And if there is someone even in the town halls that we could just send a link and if they wanna print it and just put it on their bulletin boards or how they feel to distribute it to other members of the communities that are not school age parents. Well, we're trying not to print. So Becky has a pretty tight grip on the copy paper, so. Um, no, in all seriousness, there is, um, it's constant contact, so anyone in the community can sign up for the newsletter, but if there are any uh, folks that would like to um, get a printed copy um, and post it on the bulletin board, they can al always reach out to our office. Okay, because I think it, it's such a wealth of knowledge and it hits so many different avenues and so many different age groups. And then just tying that in, I think this might be a good place to, just a suggestion, is maybe put in the paper issue and the print issue of what's happening to educate the parents about what is what's going on with the paper issue, and uh, even the great um, uh, item that uh, Becky just talked about is working with seven other districts. So we're not alone. We're all working together in this. I think the parents know when you go to the food store, you may get during the pandemic. Uh, you know, the supply chain is short on different things at different times. If it was paper towels, you know, soap, different things like that. So I think they would understand, but because I do believe the parents will think that we're coming to the end of our funds or we have a, uh, a stoppage on paper or something like that. So I think that would be really good if we could get that across to them. And then the last comment I just had, thank you, Lauren, is I saw under future agenda items that we're gonna be looking at. I like to see that they were academic based and we're gonna be looking at ELL math and SEL, because I know I brought that up in the past. So thank you very much to Lauren and for Greg for putting that on. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Joan. Um, I do have a, um, an update from the um, Town of North Rose Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Um, so it is exciting that we have completed our year's charge from the uh, Board of Selectmen. Um, and so a couple of weeks ago, um, the Diversity and Inclusion Committee presented 
their um, final report and recommendations to the Board of Selectmen. Um, so as of this time, um, the Diversity and Inclusion Committee is no longer um, no longer running as it was. Um, however, one of our recommendations was to um, make the committee a permanent committee within town. Um, and as I mentioned in the past, um, we did have discussion about um, representation of the school committee on that committee. And um, although we didn't see um, the, the, the direct value in that, keeping schools in the conversation is important. Um, and so um, it was recommended that a coalition member um, be included, which could be um, a school committee member. Um, so uh, it is sort of sad to say that this was my last report for uh, the coalition, uh, sorry, not the coalition, um, the diversity and inclusion committee. Um, if anyone is interested in seeing the final report, if you go to the Board of Selectmen's um, page on the town website, on the right hand side where it says agendas, um, you can go to the meeting packet um, for January 24th, and it's a very long document attached to there. Yes, Greg. So thank you, uh, Lauren, and I would be remiss if I did not just acknowledge the finance team and all the hard work that went into uh, preparing the budget. I should have ended the presentation on the budget with that information. I think the budget process is complex. There's a lot of moving uh, pieces and a lot of different information, and the finance team under Becky's leadership does a great job managing that while also managing the current year's budget. So Thank you, Becky, and thank you to your team for all the great work you do behind the scenes. Yes, a big thank you to Becky and her team. Thank you for the recognition, recognition Greg. Any other member reports? All right, let's see. Uh, so we're going to move on to educational policy, of which there is none, uh, which leads us to policy development and or distribution, of which there is none. And so next in your packet is personnel items. Uh, anything to mention here, Greg? Nothing uh, noteworthy um, other than, you know, again, we're seeing more normal uh, personnel reports each month, which is a, a great sign. Okay, thank you. And Kelly, you had a question? Yeah, just a question. Um, so when do, um, when do you post for the retirements and things? Is that not until like, May and June, or when do those usually post? Yeah, typically after the town meetings um, when our budget's approved. However, um, I will be having a conversation with Lauren and eventually the larger committee around getting ahead of some of the postings. Yeah. Um, as a result of the, the very competitive job market that exists, I think it would be wise for us to advertise sooner than later. But I also want to be respectful of the budget process and, and having the budget finally approved by the town meeting members. Um, but it is a conversation we'll have in the next couple of weeks around timing and what makes sense in this um, market. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so that brings us to communications of which there is none. And so we have action on minutes. Uh, we have two sets of minutes in your packet. One is the special open meeting minutes of December 22nd, 2021. And uh, we also have minutes for the open meeting of January 5th, 2022. So we're looking to approve those minutes. I can make a motion that we move to approve both the minutes on the special open meeting minutes of December 22nd, 2021 as well as the open meeting minutes of January 5th, 2022. Second. Thank you, Joan. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right, we're gonna do a roll call vote for this. Uh, Ms. Gannett? Yes, I'm trying to find it. Uh, Ms. Tagliaferri? Yes. Ms. Frank? Yes. And I am going to abstain uh, just because I was not at one of those meetings. However, they still pass um, with three um, approved and one abstain. Um, all right, that brings us to future agenda items. I know that uh, we have department presentations that we'd love to hear from, um, ELA update, um, an SEL update, as well as math. 
Um, and then tonight um, we talked about adding um, an update from Keith Lavoy about um, the mold mitigation at Proctor. Um, and we also talked about having, um, well, I guess this is for uh, the combines, but have Mass Insight come to our future combined meeting um, to tell us about um, the audits. Anything else that... Is there a yes, um, nope. public hearing on the budget? Oh, yes. More fun. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Is there a, um, a principal's PTO or happening or are we done? Are we done already? I think we have one more. I think we have Lincoln, did Lincoln do it? I think with the math update, Mary will be on, won't she? Correct, yep. Do you say? Okay. I think we have one more. I'm not sure who that one. So would one is. Might would be that would no, that happen no. next month or the following month? I think next month, Kelly. Okay. The other um, update I think um, is around the um, school grade level configuration study, and I think maybe giving a more in depth report on some of the subcommittees that are working on that task. And as a reminder, um, uh, the recommendations that come out of that study group, is that supposed to um, be coming in March or a little bit later on? I think the spring would be yeah, probably. We have a target of April. Um, okay. So April or May is, I think, realistic. Okay. Great. Anything else? All right, just feel free to email me if you have any other agenda items that come up. Um, so our approval, of, uh, our approval of bills and payrolls is now done electronically. So that brings us to audience sharing. So just as a reminder, um, we do have an audience sharing, um, or I should say a public comment um, policy now in place. Um, and so anyone who's um, looking to share, um, I encourage you to take a look at that policy if you're unfamiliar with it. All right, um, I don't see any hands raised, but I'm just gonna give everyone just another 30 seconds in case you choose to raise your hands virtually to share. I don't see anyone raising their hand, but Kelly, I do see that your hand is raised. What would you like to add? Hi, my name's Kelly Gannett. I live at 69 Northgate Road. Um, I am just talking about um, May 10th and that is town elections. And there are a number of open seats in the town. Um, well, not open seats, but there are a number of elections. So if you're interested in volunteering for the good of our town, you should check those out. Um, I know we've got a really fun group of school committee people here. And uh, if you wanna work with us, there might be a seat that's uh, available also. Keith is not seeking reelection, so. Um, if you have any questions, just reach. I would gladly talk to anybody if you have any questions about what we do more on the school committee or anything um, to tell you about us. And I also know a number of other people serving in other positions in the town. So if you want any more insight in any of that, I can connect you with anybody for that too. So thank you. I think that was under three minutes. It was. <laughs> thank you so much, Kelly. Um, anyone else? All right, so we um, are ready to adjourn. Who would like to make that motion? Yes, Joan, thank you. We move to adjourn the Wednesday, February 2nd, 2022, K to 8 School Committee meeting for Northborough. Thank you. Any second? Second. Thank you, any discussion? We'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Frank? Yes. Ms. Gannett? Yes. Ms. Tagliaferri? And myself, Lauren Bailey Jones, is a yes. It is 9.04 p.m. and we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for a great meeting, and we will see you next month. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day.